Nima, everybody today has heard the concept of the quantum, and we know that there's some tremendous developments happening in the field. So I really want to understand this, but let's start with understanding what is the quantum itself. How can we understand quantum theory? Well, um, in the late 1800s, uh, uh, we had two basic kinds of phenomenon that we'd seen uh, in nature. Um, things like light and sound waves and uh, 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 other excitations of, uh, of, of different media were described by waves, but things like uh, billiard balls and, uh, um, and uh, well, they didn't have cars, but if they had cars, cars and other things were described um, as, uh, as, as particles. Um, and uh, having these two different kinds of descriptions for phenomenon in, uh, in, in nature um, started leading to some confusions. For example, uh, when people described um, uh, light as, as waves, uh, and then they tried to figure out um, something very, very simple, like uh, uh, how much energy comes out of an oven, for example. <laughs> Um, and they applied the usual laws of classical physics, they got nonsens nonsensical answers, like an, an infinite amount of energy comes out of an other. So there, there were paradoxes associated with the, with the wave-like on the one hand and particle-like on the other hand, uh, description of the various phenomena that we saw in nature. Uh, and what people realized in the early part of the 20th century um, was that these two different uh, things that were being described by classical physics, uh, wave-like property on one hand and particle-like properties on the other, um, were in the end of the day all actually describing particles. Um, but particles uh, th that don't move according uh, to the laws of classical mechanics, but move instead according to the laws of quantum mechanics, which are very, very different than, uh, than, than, than the classical laws that, that govern particles. Uh, for example, there was the famous uncertainty principle that said that uh, um, while while in the world of classical physics we associate the, the movement of a particle through space and time by specifying its position and its velocity at, a, at any given uh, at any given point, that we can't in fact specify the position and the velocity to infinite accuracy, and that if we know the position very well, uh, we don't know the velocity very well, and vice versa. And all of this happened um, uh, in conjunction with the realization that there's a new fundamental constant of nature, um, Planck's constant, uh, which uh, 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 which determined when, um, when uh, uh, classical approximations uh, to the real underlying quantum physics uh, um, uh, uh, was good and when that classical approximation broke down. Uh, I should also say, I mean, there, 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 were, there were many other paradoxes of this sort. The one that I mentioned about the infinite energy in an oven was the one that led Planck himself to the first realization that there was something wrong and that the, uh, the, uh, the, the classical rules governing uh, light had to be, had to be modified. Um, the specific way it had to be modified uh, was uh, rather simple, by the way. Uh, uh, classically, we, we, we might imagine having a, a light of some given frequency. Um, and we can make the power, the intensity, or the amount of energy carried in that light beam as small as we want. Um, and, uh, and Planck realized that, that, that uh, he could make sense of uh, um, these difficulties with the infinite amount of energy coming out of an oven um, by positing instead that for a given wavelength of light or a given frequency of light, there was a certain minimum amount of uh, energy that was, uh, uh, that was compatible with that frequency. And this the is energy, the discrete piece. And this is, in the end, the, uh, the, the, indeed, the, uh, the discrete piece, the, the quantum <laughs> of uh, quantum physics as it entered uh, Planck's vocabulary was, to, uh, was, was, was indeed to uh, tell us that for a given frequency, there was just an absolute minimum amount of energy that light could have, and it couldn't go any smaller than So energy than, comes than in, in pieces, so in that, particles. So, so, uh, so, that, so, that the, so that the energy in light, indeed, comes in, comes in discrete packets. Now, Planck himself, um, while introducing, while you know, opening the door to this revolutionary concept, uh, could never himself um, uh, uh, believe or buy all of its consequences. <laughs> so it, in fact, it took Einstein um, to really, uh, to really make the leap and say that, uh, that, that, that Planck's discovery meant that light came in little parcels. Light came in particles, uh, photons, 
um, and that uh, at a given frequency there was a minimum amount, there was a minimum energy photon whose energy was given by Planck's constant times its, uh, its uh, frequency. And, um, and that description of light uh, made a number of uh, uh, correct predictions. Um, now today we know that, that from this there's a tr large number of, of, of observations which we know to be true but which seem counterintuitive to our normal macroscopic lives. Uh, particles uh, entangled, uh, 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 tunneling effects where things seem to jump from one place to the other. And th this has, uh, uh, seems to be impossible but it is real. It is absolutely real, I mean, and uh, one of the uh, one of the unfortunate things about the way sometimes quantum mechanics is uh, is uh, described um, is uh, that there's there's an awful lot of uh, mysticism uh, uh, associated with it, and uh, uncertainty means that everything uh, that we can't be sure of anything, and maybe consciousness has something to do with uh, with, with with the way the world is, and and there, there, there's an awful lot of nonsense uh, um, said about quantum mechanics, whereas in fact uh, quantum mechanics is responsible for the Absolute stability of everything, uh, of 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 everything uh, we're made of, of uh, of atoms, for example. Because the electrons uh, right. can't occupy the same position. Right. I mean, that there, there there was this old classical picture um, that 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 an atom uh, was was like a little solar system with an electron uh, orbiting around uh, uh, with electrons orbiting around the um, nucleus. And uh, there were a variety of problems with that picture. One of them was that uh, that you would think that that the electrons would quickly lose energy and spiral <laughs> into the nucleus, and atoms would be completely unstable. Right. Um, and another one, a related one, is that it, even even if you ignored that problem, uh, you could imagine lots of different solar systems with lots mm -hmm. of different distances. And and why why were all yeah. the atoms identical? Why yeah. why is why is everything's made out of the same same stuff? Yeah. And both of these mysteries were solved by uh, quantum mechanics with with the realization that it was impossible for the electron to fall into the nucleus because if it did you would know both where it was and how quickly it was moving at the same time and and uh, and uh, um, and the uncertainty principle tells you that that's that's not possible so the uncertainty principle actually creates stability and absolute confidence exactly in the modern world. exactly the, the, the uncertainty principle far from introducing all kinds of fuzzy garbage right, right, right. Uh, actually allows things to be stable right. and is responsible for all the gross properties of matter right. that, that, that we see in the world okay right. let's fast forward to today and tell me about these serious problems in quantum mechanics and what are some of the potential areas of, uh, of excitement and, and possible solution? Well, um, in many ways, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, theoretical crises today that in some ways harken back to the sorts of problems that we had in the uh, in the late 1890s, that uh, that uh, that led Planck, for example, to, to the uh, uh, to his uh, to, to to introduce quantum mechanics to begin with, and it all has to do with the fact that in our understanding of quantum mechanics, um, uh, um, and also putting quantum mechanics together with special relativity, uh, actually putting these two things together um, uh, forces us to introduce. Antiparticles, which are yeah. or, antimatter partners to uh, or, to ordinary particles, and the two of these things together um, give rise to uh, to uh, to this interesting fact that that the vacuum, what what we like to think of as just emptiness, um, is not in fact really is not really empty, and it's a very very rich place with all kinds of interesting dynamics. So that's something that's forced on us by both quantum mechanics and special relativity, and. Um, more or less, all of our problems have to do with those uh, quantum fluctuations of particles and antiparticles popping in and out of existence, out of the vacuum, as allowed by the uncertainty principle. Um, making sense of those uh, fluctuations of the vacuum uh, gives rise to a variety of, uh, of, of real crises in our, in our understanding of, uh, of, of physics today. Um, two of them... Uh, have to do with um, ultimately the question of why it is that we have a universe with such incredibly different and disparate uh, and interesting uh, length scales where where interesting physical phenomena happen. Um, uh, you know, the tiniest distances that we've explored at our very highest energy uh, accelerators is something like 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. That's around 100 times smaller than the size of a proton. Uh, the largest distances that we've explored are something like 10 to the plus 28 centimeters. That's around the observable size of the universe. And in, theoretically, in our mind's eye, we can take all the laws of physics that we know 
uh, quantum mechanics, special relativity, and this generalization to describe gravity, general relativity. Um, and, uh, and, and using those, we can, uh, we can imagine uh, extrapolating to very, very short distances around uh, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, uh, called the Planck length. So, um, so there are these huge, very, very disparate, interesting length scales, apparently, in, in the universe. Um, that, that's a very salient fact about the universe, that, uh, that, that there are incredibly different uh, length scales. And yet, um, quantum mechanics, and indeed these quantum fluctuations of the vacuum, uh, seem to be very much at odds with that very basic fact about the universe. Um, so, uh, uh, for instance, um, quantum fluctuations of the vacuum um, have some energy. Um, and, uh, and Einstein told us that, uh, that uh, any energy uh, gravitates. Um, any energy gives rise to some curvature of space and time. So if we take these quantum fluctuations uh, uh, in the vacuum and we just estimate the amount of energy that they carry and figure out what that would do to the universe, we get a completely nonsensical answer. That, uh, that uh, if you just do a back of the envelope estimate, you would conclude that the universe is, for example, doubling in size, uh, accelerating very, very rapidly, doubling in size, and the doubling time would be every Planck time. That Planck time is around 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Okay, so, 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 you know, if you took a theorist and locked them up in a room and asked them to say, please, here is the universe, here are the laws as we know them, please give a prediction for what you think the universe looks like, they would not remotely predict the universe that, that, that we see, uh, because this, this, the energy in the vacuum would be just gra grossly larger than what we apparently observe it to be. Okay, so that's, that's, that's one of the crises that, that we have. And you've talked about that maybe we're missing something big. Right, so I think uh, um, uh, uh, the problems with, these, uh, with taming these uh, quantum yeah. fluctuations of the vacuum uh, don't appear to be a little technical yeah. problem or something, yeah. or, a, or a disagreement between theory and experiment in the sixth decimal place of some, of some calculation. Uh, there are problems of you know, roughly 120 orders of magnitude, or uh, there is an analogous problem with, uh, for trying to understand the question why gravity is so weak. Um, uh, there too, the fluctuations of the vacuum want to make all the particles that we know and love much, much, much heavier. Uh, and uh, if they were much, much, much heavier, then gravity would be a lot stronger because everything would be a lot heavier. And then you and I would be black holes. It would be a very <laughs> unpleasant universe. Uh, so, so there are th those are two two questions that are directly tied to the quantum fluctuations of the vacuum that seem to want to to, to drag things to as high an energy, as short a distance as uh, as 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 possible. And uh, one of the problems. Um, has to do with uh, why the universe isn't accelerating every 10 of the minus, doubling in size every 10 of the minus 43 seconds. That's called the cosmological constant problem. Uh, the other problem of why we aren't all black holes is called the uh, hierarchy problem. And they're each sort of very large, numerically very large problems. They're, they're the, the, the amount by which the estimate and the answer is off is something like 120 orders of magnitude for the first one, 30 orders of magnitude for the second one. And so we think there's got to be some very big new principles uh, missing that, uh, that, that allow us to figure out why the answers are in fact uh, uh, what they are.